Hello, everyone. Um, so wonderful to have everyone joining us today again. Um, I'm here in person, Visible Centre. We've got um, Steve and David here with us, and um, a lot of friends online as well. And um, just wanted to say, like, you know, great that we were taking this time for ourselves and centering ourselves on the Dharma um, and rejoicing in learning from venerable and learning from each other. So this is if, not that you need permission, but this is your permission to let everything else go, everything worldly go and come back to the Dharma and the moment, the present moment. So today we have from vigilance in inspection to vigilant introspection, lessons from the cyber world with Venerable Zhu Wei. Venerable Dr. Zhu Wei holds a PhD in religious studies a Master of Arts in Buddhist Studies, a Master of Business Administration, and Master of Science in Computer Science and Engineering. Venerable Jue began her career as an applied R&D engineer in artificial intelligence systems in the 1980s. However, made her millennial decision to join the Fou Guang Shan Order, when she realized that she could be of best service to humanity through promoting humanistic values in an increasingly divided world. Zhu Wei is now head of Program for Applied Buddhist Studies and Humanistic Buddhism, Director of Humanistic Buddhism Centre and Senior Lecturer at Nante Institute in Australia, where she teaches subjects supported by her research. Wow, wonderful to have you here, Venerable Zhu Wei, with us. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say about humanistic subjects and the cyber world. Um, this will be a very interactive session, so sit tight and get ready. The session will also be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. Um, without further, further ado, over to you, Venerable. Thank you so much, Sophia, for the kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for making the time to be here. I'm just very touched by um, some of you who are at midnight, some of you in the afternoons, you may be in between work from all corners of um, this cyber world. <laughs> That's why we can connect. And thank you too to Meta Center for organizing this event. I'm very privileged to be able to be a part of your series of um, talks. So I'm going to first ask for permission to screen share. And let me know if you're able to see the screen. Is it all good? Yes, I can see. Thank you. By the way, I've, I've changed the title a little bit as I've um, prepared for this talk that I'm not only taking lessons from the cyber world, I think we can also have lessons for the cyber world. So bi-direction. So as is the beautiful tradition of Australia, I would like to begin by recognizing the importance placed on cultural practice by Australia's first people and respect cultural diversity in all forms. So in the spirit of reconciliation, the Nantian Institute would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we walk on, study on, and reside on, the Wadi Wadi people of the Darawal Nation, we pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend those respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of today. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which you all are and pay my respects to their elders. I feel very empowered with this acknowledgement because it reminds me how much wisdom reside among us and how well they have been passed down to us, if and only if we will listen and apply their insights. Such values can bring us closer together as a responsible human race. In the next 80 minutes or so, I would like to suggest the following agenda. First, to share a meditation for a few minutes so that we can center ourselves, followed by well, a little bit of rambling from me on vigilant inspection and vigilant introspection. 
We will then break out into groups to draw lessons from and for the cyber world we are in. We will, of course, leave some time for Q&A at the end, but do feel free to post questions in the chat stream anytime so that you do not lose those questions. But I will not attend to them till this Q&A time because as an old nun, I just cannot multitask very well anymore. So finally, before we go, we will have an opportunity for dedication of, of merits in the Mindful Checkout. So shall we first check it, body and mind? for just a few minutes before starting our discussion. It is a characteristic of um, many of my classes that I conduct in the Nantian Institute to start our um, day of classes with a mindful check-in. And this particular mindful check-in app is developed by us at the Nantian Institute. So let's now begin. It is now time to check in. From wherever you've come, that is now behind you. Let's focus on the present, because there is nothing more important than the gift of the moment. Please ensure that you are in a safe place. You may either sit or stand with your spine upright. If your legs are crossed, uncross them. Place your hands on your sides or on your lap. Gently close your eyes. We will begin by scanning the body for any areas of tightness and relaxing those tensions. Let's start from the top of your head. Relax. Relax your forehead, your eyes, your ears, your facial muscles, your lips, Relax. Feel tensions evaporating from your head. And now, let's move on to your neck muscles. Relax. Shoulders. Upper arms. Lower arms, hands, fingers. Slowly let them go. Now work your way down the spinal cord. Relax one vertebra at a time. Your thigh muscles, calf muscles, your feet, toes. Feel all tensions melting into Mother Earth. The next step is to scan for any remaining areas of tension and anxieties. Honour them and the conditions that have led to their arising. Gently, ever so gently, let these tensions and anxieties out of the body and your system. Now that the body is completely relaxed, let's slowly bring your attention to the tip of your nose. Breathe. 
Watch every in-breath and out-breath without control and without judgments. There is nowhere else to go and nothing else to do. Simply continue to watch your breath until you hear the sound of the bell. Slowly, bring your awareness away from the breath to your ears. Hear what is going on around you, still maintaining a quiet body and mind. Gradually move your attention to the eyes. Gently open your eyes and smile. Be grateful to all the conditions that give you whatever you have before you. You are now ready for the miraculous moment to be the best that you can be. Thank you very much, everyone for joining me in this mindful check-in session. And now, just for a few thoughts that I have about vigilant inspection in the cyber world. Let me just start by asking a question. What did you usually do when you hear the phone ring? For years, I've been trained that when the phone rings, I should pick it up. In fact, I was told to pick it up within three rings. But these days, I will not answer my mobile phone if I do not know who is calling. And I have to consciously prevent myself from answering that phone. Now, what do you do when you receive a call for help? Bodhisattvas have been trained to help strangers. So when we receive an email from a friend or relative asking for money, we used to quickly send some cash off to help. 
Nowadays, you cannot do that anymore. I'm not sure what to do now if I were in need of help. I do not know who I could call who would pick up my phone. I wonder if it may be better just to call triple zero or SES and let's hope that an old Buddhist nun like me will never be stranded without money because no one now will wire me money. You probably do not need a Buddhist nun to tell you what's happening in the cyber world. Criminality is digitizing. Cyber crimes attack individuals and businesses. Most of the time, these attacks attempt to steal money or valuable data. And in 2021, ransomware and phishing were two of the leading cyber crimes. Has anyone online not received a phishing email or text? You can raise a digital hand if you have never received a phishing email or text. Phishing is the fraudulent practice of sending SMS and emails claiming to be from reputable companies such as banks or phone providers to trick their customers into revealing personal information such as passwords and credit card numbers, which can then be used to steal from them. I don't know about you, but I'm constantly receiving SMS from various um, sources claiming to be some Chinese embassy and I have mail that's the last call for me to receive some messages from them, some important messages, just curious things. Then there's malware. Malware is very worrying. It's malicious software that's installed on a digital device without the user's consent. And I've just found out they're like bad habits that evolve into something far worse. Once malware enters the device, it attaches itself to different files and then overwrites its data. Malware code are commonly reused and transform themselves into variant strains to add new capabilities. And these malware can dodge threat hunters. Hence, they are very hard to remove because some can reinstall themselves even after they have been detected and even after the software has told you that they have been removed. According to a joint advisory from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency and the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, the typical lifespan of the most prevalent malware strains was at least five years. So can you imagine? We may have well malware just sitting in our computer systems waiting to be activated for at least five years. Then ransomware is a type of malware in which one regains access to your data only after a ransom is paid. And so this worrying list goes on. Well, what this talk has done is that it has provided me with an opportunity to conduct some research into the cybercrime business. And well, the, I've been doing so much cybercrime business, I'm just getting worried the FBI may be after me. They may be wondering, what is this Buddhist nun doing with cybercrime research? Well, there's a Chinese saying that says, quote, know your enemy and know yourself and you will win a hundred battles, unquote. So let's get to know a little bit about cyber crimes. Why is it so prevalent? In 2022, the global cost of cyber crime is $6 trillion. Trillion, imagine. And according to Cybersecurity Ventures, the annual global cost of cybercrime is estimated to be 10.5 trillion by 2025. I think that's quite a conservative estimate if it's already $6 trillion now. 
So while banks and credit card companies, and those of us in Australia may know, you know phone companies look like prime targets, cyber criminals also prioritize targeting healthcare organizations because patient records and information are worth up to 40 times, four zero, 40 times more than other types of information, even credit cards. So if you steal a credit card number, that's going to be known immediately when used, right? Because we as users will track our statements. But in healthcare, you get all the identifiers of an individual and you can do identity theft over the long term. And you can do pharmaceutical theft, services theft, and then you can create new credit streams with all that identifier information. And all that may take a long time to be discovered. At the same time, hackers are eyeing bigger and more critical targets, such as government departments and agencies, with potentially wide-scale consequences across society. And there are lots of intangible costs as well. The effect on victims' mental health, the impact on brand reputation, and the undermining of public trust in businesses and institutions. So the four noble truths tell us that there is suffering or there's dukkha, but there are also causes and conditions that led to that suffering, whether it's mental, whether it's fiscal, whether it's reputational. So what led to the lucrative cybercrime business? Over the last two years, the pivot to remote working caused by the COVID-19 pandemic has seen many industries undergo an accelerated process of digitalization. Systems needed to be in place to enable activities to continue, from video conferencing for work to online grocery services for daily necessities. This trend was boosted by a proliferation of platforms and devices. So while business activities were able to continue, entry points for cybercrime also increased during this COVID-19 pandemic period. A shortage of cybersecurity professionals and patchwork governance mechanisms have aggravated this risk manifold. The surge in cybercrime threatens to outpace society's ability to manage and respond to it. As is long known, humans are the weakest link in the cybersecurity train. As far back as May 2016, that is six years ago, there was an article entitled, Cybercrime Relies on Human Frailties. Cybercrime can exploit human nature as much as technical vulnerabilities, so people and enterprises need to guard against both kinds of exposure. The article begins with stating that cybercrime techniques such as phishing exploit traits that are peculiarly human. They deploy social engineering, the manipulation of traits like curiosity, sympathy, or greed to get people to share sensitive information, click on links that execute malware, and security is often relaxed when you trust the person or company you are dealing with. But what happens if the entity you trust is not who they say they are? Social engineering is a psychological strategy to trick victims into providing sensitive data such as usernames, passwords, and other personally identifiable information. It is this dramatically increasing use of social engineering that we need to watch out for. In 2022, cybercrime expert Simon Smith said, People were easily tricked by SMS scams because there's no way to differentiate between a legitimate number and one used by a scammer. His only advice is emphatic, don't click on any links. Instead, if people receive a text message about security issue and any other problem, 
they should contact the bank or other institution separately. Smith said that people, quote, love convenience, unquote, which is what helps scammers. It's so much more convenient later on not to have to go through chasing your identity and changing all your details. Research on 273 university students in 2018 found that an individual will give up some privacy for convenience, which will have a sizable erosion on security. For example, an individual may voluntarily surrender some personal privacy in order to use a convenient mobile application. Also, human factors such as carelessness, optimism, and experiential reliance, especially on authoritative sources, they may all these due to what? Poor human factor design. And these can contribute to many of the top computer security risks. So since the human is the weakest link in the information security train, then the best defense is to build a strong human firewall, quote unquote, human firewall, capable of recognizing threats and defending against them. Many companies institute cybersecurity training. A PhD dissertation at University of Colorado shows that it is possible to gauge a person's susceptibility to cyber crimes by looking at a person's behavioral and social media usage factors. It discovers that bad habits override knowledge. And I repeat, bad habits override knowledge. So even though we may have the knowledge of what is the right or not the right thing to do, but our karma can take over. So certainly having the knowledge does reduce a person's risk of falling victim to social engineering schemes, but knowledge alone doesn't fix the problem. I hope that my research thus far has convinced you to exercise vigilance in putting knowledge into practice. The cyber Mara is all around us and the brains of the syndicates behind this cyber Mara are very, very cunning. Get trained on how to prevent, detect, and defend against cyber attacks. But theory itself is inadequate. Please practice vigilance. Exercise right effort with vigilant inspection of every SMS message, email, and social media post. Do not click on suspicious links. Do not divulge sensitive information, overcome our karmic habit to be curious, sympathetic, greedy, lazy, careless, optimistic, and overly reliant on authority. Very importantly, slow down, pause, and be mindful. A 2022 Piece of research, so just conducted this year, has established that a sample of young adults with low self-control are more prone to cybercrime victimization through risky online behaviors. How much self-control do you have? Now, at this point in time, I want to just stop share for a moment. And I'm going to share my screen again. So, since we speak about pausing, let's practice it ourselves. I'd like to suggest that we take a three minute break to allow for our thoughts to sink in. What lessons did you take away about this cyber criminal world that we are immersed in? What does vigilant inspection mean to you? If you have a notepad, whether it's digital or hard copy, feel free to journal your thoughts down 
onto your notepad and we can use that for a sharing later on um, this evening. And let's take a three minute pause break. Vigilant inspection is inspecting the external world. I've mentioned the word the human firewall, quote unquote, human firewall earlier. It's a borrowed term. I found it on the internet describing a team of trained and well behaved employees who will detect data breaches and protect the security of the organization. I see that the real human firewall, though, is not outside, but inside our minds, because the root cause is human frailties, as we have seen in the last section. Hence the need for introspection. And in this day and age, Introspection is not adequate. We need vigilant introspection. For vigilant introspection, I turn to a great Mahayana classic, the Bodhicharya Bhattara, translated sometimes as the way of the Bodhisattva or guide to the way of the Bodhisattva 
among the various other translations of this title. It is an 8th century Sanskrit poem presented in the form of a personal meditation by an Indian monk, Shanti Deva. This is a very popular text and studied widely in many monastic curricula, including in Huo Guangshan too. As a result, there are many different translations. Today, I used the 2006 Shambhala Classics edition translated by the Patamakara Translation Group because I find it quite readable. The poem is divided into 10 chapters, as you can see on the screen. And for today, let's focus on chapter five, Vigilant Introspection. I will refer to a few verses that resonates with me, and I hope they will for you too. I'd like to ask the organizers, Sophia or Elise, to post a uh, Word document that I've put together, I've excerpted, excerpted some verses from this particular chapter. And you can feel free to download that Word document and refer to it as I move along. And we will also later in our breakout room, you can also refer to those verses. So these few verses, I hope, um, if you don't see them in the list on the Word document, don't worry. I think I've I'm referring, I've added some new verses, but they are, they are all saying that quite the same thing. So let's start from the beginning, verse one. What I call the Buddhist project is to free ourselves from suffering or dukkha and defilements that lead to that dukkha. Buddhists know that the real task is to defeat the defilements that are in our minds not to overcome suffering out there alone. This chapter opens with this verse that you see on screen. Those who wish to keep the trainings must with perfect self-possession guard their minds. Without the guard upon the mind, the trainings cannot be preserved. So by the trainings, you could have, we could refer to the five precepts, the six perfections, just to name a few. So the problem is not that defilements occur in our minds, but rather nine out of 10 times, we are not aware that they are there. When we are not aware of the presence of tiny defilements, then by the time they are seen, they would have acquired such dimensions and strength that in the ordinary run of things, we are just powerless to prevent their consequences. So for example, what good is it for me to be so disciplined as to install antivirus on my phone and laptop if I do not discipline myself to carefully check the sender of every email and text message? In fact, it can be even more dangerous if I depend too much on an external software and not discipline my mind to do the checking. So the most important practice is to start by guarding and disciplining the mind. Verse 25 says, for those who have no introspection, though they hear the teachings, ponder them or meditate, like water seeping from a leaking jar, their learning will not settle in their memories. So that this tells us the importance of introspection to check our minds. The sudden outburst of rage or any impulse or arrogant words that can have life-changing consequences have their sources deep in our consciousness. Perhaps it was a moment of desire or impatience. If that moment had been averted, 
this negative energy will not have much power. And when it appears again, it would be easy to dispel or neutralize. So the good news is that this mind of ours is the wellspring of suffering, but it's also the wellspring of every joy. We are very empowered, but we must put in the right effort. So how does one become so, so self-possessed, so vigilant that I can scrutinize every impulse? Shanti Deva prescribes something called continuous vigilance. Shanti Deva recommends that the moment we feel any urge to do anything, we should get into the habit of self scrutiny. Have you noticed the eyes of the Bodhisattvas and the Buddhas? They are always cast down and turned inwards. So we should use that as our model. Each time we look at the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, notice how their eyes are turned inwards. They do not allow their gaze to be wandering all around. Instead, always go about with eyes cast down. And if we were to relax our gaze and raise our eyes, meet the eyes of others with a friendly word and a friendly gaze. Shantideva urges us to examine our everyday behavior, all the little things that we habitually overlook. I highly recommend that you try to read this chapter uh, beyond these excerpts when you have a chance because it prescribes to us many behaviors that we can undertake every day, including how we should close our doors gently and not allow it to slam. So we should not excuse ourselves with thought that all these little things are just insignificant and we don't need to bother about them. In this vigilant practice, it is indeed the subliminal impulses that require the closest attention. For example, do not multitask because multitasking would not allow us to be vigilant. In research done on emergency physicians in 2015, it is found that multitasking, defined as the performance of two tasks simultaneously, is not possible, except when the behaviors become completely automatic. So instead, physicians rapidly switch between small tasks. And this task switching causes disruption in the primary task, and they contribute to errors. So general rule, do not multitask. So hence, let's practice completing one task before moving on to the next. Stop the habit of allowing our attention to drift, especially when notification alerts appear on our phone. Shantideva reminds us that everything we do affects the world. Any action can be the cause of or the cause of the cause of another's suffering. Right speech is actually very difficult, if not the most difficult practice. And speaking without thinking is very common. And we all know words can hurt, words can inspire. So that's why verse 45 encourages us not to be engaged in pointless conversations. No thought should be allowed to develop into unchallenged words or actions. Shanti Deva says that if we feel the urge to walk across the room or to speak, Get into the habit of self-scrutiny, okay? Keep checking and asking ourselves, what is that impulse? The slightest impulse to negativity must be curbed with total paralysis. That's why Shantideva refers to being like 
a log of wood. So we can become the master of ourselves with a heightening of our consciousness. We will become awakened to an understanding of ourselves that most other people pass unnoticed and unexamined. Shantideva now moves on to tell us to keep a smile on our face and be a friend to all. And of course, friends should not be carrying scowls and frowns. So be the master of ourselves. In Buddhism, happiness comes from the reduction or elimination of suffering and causes of suffering. And in Buddhism, the source of suffering is in the mind and hence unrelated with one's wealth. Through five studies, research by Titova and Sheldon shows that um, happiness comes from trying to make others feel good rather than oneself. And there's been quite a fair bit of research done in this area that true happiness really comes when we make others feel good. And when we are able to rejoice in the success of others, that's a beautiful habit to cultivate. So therefore, Shadideva says to take pleasure in the excellence of others. Let them be a heartfelt joy to you. So this is again, keep checking, checking on the emotions, the feelings that's going on in our mind. Do they cohere with good Buddhist values? And finally, as is the Bodhisattva motivation, Shantideva reminds practitioners to always ensure that the motivation for their every action is the bodhicitta, that is for the happiness and enlightenment of others. So here we say to do nothing that's not for the other's sake and solely for their welfare, dedicate your every action to their enlightenment. I hope that these few verses have given you a little food for thought and the urge to read the full chapter or poem even better. There are many verses to remind us how we should eat, walk, and move about so that we train ourselves to be humble, careful, and carefree. I'm now going to give us another chance for a pause, a pause for us again to allow our thoughts to percolate. What lessons did you take away from the excerpts of the Bodhicharya Vatara? What does vigilant introspection mean to you? So let's take again a few minutes to journal down what we have learned. And after this, I will arrange for a breakout session.
Let us now apply the lessons from the Vigilant Introspection chapter of the Bodhicharya Vatara to how we may traverse the cyber world with some ease. We will do so in breakout groups of three to four. Um, what we'll do is that we'll have an opportunity to make some new friends or renew friendship in the Dharma using your notes that you have captured during your reflections and the excerpts in your handout. Let's discuss how vigilant introspection can help you traverse that cyber world with ease and how the happenings in the cyber world may inform your dharma practice. It will be great if in your discussion, you may also appoint a spokesperson to briefly share a summary of your insights, either in the chat or if, the, if time permits, we may actually have a, a discussion together. Let me stop share. See if anybody has any questions before we go into breakouts. Just feel free to raise your digital hand if you have a question and unmute and ask. If not, I'm going to ask Elise or Sophia to send us into breakout rooms. Hello. Sophia, are you there? Yes, we're here. Hi. Hi. Hi, how was that just now? Yeah, that was good. Yeah, what do you guys think? People in the room? <laughs> David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Do you mean the lecture or do you mean the breakout room? Anyone. How was the lecture? How was the breakout? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, lecture was unreal, actually. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you. You're all very generous. Now, how many people? Very like, oh, very like how you were saying, they, um, the, the, the scammers work on our like, greed or convenience. In fact, like, like the way, like I've had plenty of like messages before where, like, you know, send me a dollar and we'll give you a free iPhone. You sort of stop and think to yourself, hang on a sec, why would somebody give me uh, something <laughs> worth a grand and a half for only one dollar? That's right. They get you in, they suck you in with the detail then, and they use that detail to then take more money off you. <laughs> That's right. So we have to be careful also what's going on in our mind at that time. What are we inspired by? By greed or by, you know, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so Steve, who left, really liked the poems you shared as well. He actually took a photo of the book he said he was going to read that later too. That was really awesome. The, this poem is so beautiful. I, I really urge everyone, if you have a chance to read it, to read it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Venerable Zhishan has asked, if y'all want a group photo, she, she can help to arrange a group photo. Yeah, sure. Right. Okay. That would be great. Okay, good. So yeah. we'll try to arrange a group photo before 8.30 because she needs to leave at 8.30. Yeah, sure. We'll leave it to you if you'd like to. Yeah. I Well, I have to leave before 8.30. I'm going to melt in my soul. Oh, yeah. What time do you usually sleep, Venerable? I usually go to bed before 9. Oh, wow. I'm a 9 to 5 baby, you know. I sleep at 8 <laughs> And I work from nine to five. <laughs> I strive to be a nine to five baby, but <laughs> if I'm not nine to five, I will not have enough energy to be introspective. <laughs> <laughs> Vigilantly introspective at that. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> oh dear, all that has been recorded too. <laughs> A fun bunch. Yes, maybe you can come in person sometime. It'll be wonderful. Well, I've been to in March. Yay! That'll be awesome. Yeah, in March we'll look at art instead. My my plan is that we're going to look at some very reflective art pieces, and then we can talk through those art pieces together. We'll workshop the art pieces together. Wow! Look forward to it. That'll be so awesome. Yeah, yeah, do something different, right? Yeah, very creative. Hmm. 
So are the people coming back soon? I can, should I let them back? I can do that now. Okay, has, it been, has it been about a minute? Yeah, why don't we just send them back? So 8.15, we should come That's back. That's good. I'll let them back. Okay. Venerable, like, so do you have, like, an extensive curriculum at Foshan? At Nantian Institute, we have. Yeah. At Nantian Institute, we have a very, actually, I think, a very nice applied Buddhist studies curriculum. Yeah. We just finished a course. Um, we just finished a subject on Buddhism and interreligious understanding. Oh, really great. Very cool. I know. Very nice. <laughs> Hey, I think is everyone back, you think? I think so. Hi, yeah. everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a good time in your breakout groups. And um, I'd like to invite you to share perhaps a uh, summary of what you have discussed. You can put it in the chat so it's available. Or... If you wish, you could raise your digital hand and then share with us in person. But if you want to speak, keep it to a minute or so. I'm going to start by inviting the Meta Center group to unmute and share what you have discussed in a minute. Yeah, I suppose just what all of the shares, just that whole of just using. But I've got a few scams there, like they're like asking a big, asking me for one dollar for a brand spanking new mobile phone. You sort of got to just stop and sort of think for a sec. Why would somebody just be giving me something that's worth two grand for like one dollar? I think it's a matter of just stopping and thinking about you know how you reply back to emails. Yay! Thank you. Thank you so much. Is that David? Was that yes, yeah, yeah. Hi, David. So thank you so much for sharing. Indeed, so much um, scams out there. And what are they doing? They're actually testing our, um, our meditative concentration. They're checking if, we are, if um, they could, they could um, exploit our curiosity, our greed. So please, let's all check everything vigilantly before we respond. Anyone else would like to share? Let me see what's in the chat. Well, Lightin has said that um, to check your credit card transactions regularly. Yes, definitely is a good tip. Not to fall into addiction on social media. Yes, all these fake news. They become a habit over time. So we have to be very mindful of our actions on digital platforms, to be vigilant within ourselves and stay calm and peaceful. Thank you. Now, any other groups would like to share? Um, uh, from This is from our group. Um, uh, so we were uh, May, Sam, and uh, Angela. Uh, and um, what we uh, discussed was uh, how um, on the uh, external for the cybercrime, I mean, um, of course, to be careful of um, phish uh, phishing and hacking and, and fraud. Yes. Um, and then May, Sam shared a story um, about um, her and her husband, uh, where she, they got a call from uh, somebody who said they were from the bank. And then um, I think she um, was cautious about it. And then they, they actually went to the bank um, and then they, you know, found out that it wasn't um, really from the bank. So, it, you know, they, they were very careful um, in this case. Um, and then uh, Angela also um, said that she's, uh, very careful and um, if something like that happens then you know uh, just to politely um, say say no um, um, and this I think uh, relates to um, you know a reflection of greed being uh, for, for being greedy uh, for others and also for ourselves not to um, get trapped by it and then um, to watch our own minds as well um, I think I think that's the point of the the text you shared today. That's right. Yeah. yeah. 
Thank you, John. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for summarizing your group's valuable, very invaluable experiences. That's what we need to share more of. Certainly not to trust somebody who didn't show their faces and going to the bank personally. That's great. Good. I see a hand up, Sophia. You might say something. I was going to sort of say that I actually went to make a donation for a charity organisation today. And then when I gave my actual my bank card details across there, the actual girl that was from the charity didn't ask for the security number. And she was actually saying to me, she said, look, if ever you get approached for any charity organisation asking for like donations and that, she said, never ever give them the security code on the back of your card. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not just sort of like, I didn't even know that as well. So I only found that out today as well. But so it's not something worth forward and pass on to everybody. They don't need to actually know the security security card on the back of your card. That's very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yes, certainly. Don't give away all the identifying information of your credit card. These are all such good tips. So then now we have to use that to mirror back into our mind. Also, I'll be careful about the web of interconnected dots in our minds. How one thing leads to another, to another, to another. Sometimes it's so hard to identify our motivation, what's causing us to perhaps do something um, good or not. So therefore, constant, vigilant introspection. And we have to keep go getting ourselves into that habit. In the cyber world of today, cyber dukkha is inevitable. We are, and I think all of you have lots of experience to share. And I'm so grateful to you for sharing your experiences and how we can help one another, giving ourselves lots of tips. We are already very entrenched in cyber cookies and none of our data or even our clicks are private anymore. Cyber Mara or the syndicate of Cyber Mara is as intricate as the World Wide Web. Hence, vigilant inspection is only our first line of defense. But this cyber world is just a modern mirror of the even more complex karmic web that makes up who we are. And I hope today's lecture has given us a little bit of awareness that this cyber world is a big warning to us of what's happening inside us. This is why a very clever Buddha taught us over 2,500 years ago that suffering or dukkha is inevitable. The conditions are too deep and the causes too primal. That confusion is so embedded in us. It takes vigilant introspection to get out of this mess. So we should not be blaming the cyber world for it is our creation and it is our mirror. We use it well and it will be our stepping stone to Nirvana. I hope that message has come across to you well today. And with that, I'd like to um, check out. And at the end of check out, I'm going to invite our Venerable Jishan to help us with a group photo. But I would like first um, for us to take a minute to check out. So please allow me to share my screen. Let us now dedicate the goodness of what you have done to all living beings. May kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity pervade all worlds. 
may we cherish and build affinities to benefit all beings. May Chan, Pure Land and Precepts inspire equality and patience. May our gratitude and humility give rise to great vows. If you are interested in this free app, please feel free to look for Mindful Check-in in your App Store or Google Play Store. It's free to download, so don't pay anyone any money to download this app. Um, and has no strings attached. And finally, if you'd like to continue this conversation, you're welcome to join the Nantian Institute's Communities of Practice weekly Sunday check-in sessions at 11 a.m. AEDT. Everyone has a lovely, lovely evening tonight. Goodbye.